So hi everyone, welcome to Nutrition Around the World. So it's a platform to share healthy recipes at the same time. We're chatting about different countries and uh, we, have, we go on on bi-weekly basis. So you're welcome also to join the chat with us. You can have your comments posted into the chat box or questions. And uh, just to mention about last uh, episode, so we have uh, uh, previously fried, fal fried falafel and tabbouleh recipe. So if you want to access that one, just go to the health services website or uh, food services websites. All the links will be posted to the chat box as well. Uh, today, uh, chat is also recorded, so you can have an access to it afterwards. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone. So I'll start at the beginning with a little bit of introductions and then um, uh, introduction of the destination as well of the recipe and afterwards we'll start our recipe. So starting with myself, my name is Rose. I work at Algonquin College Health Services as health promotion educator and um, just a fun fact about myself that uh, I love to travel, I love shopping and I'm a cheese lover. So one of the best places that I have visited was uh, in Montreal, the Atwater Market. Um, it was an amazing place to taste different types of all the cheese in specific. <laughs> Moving to my co-worker, Tamara. Hey, yeah, it's funny that you went to Montreal and got some cheese. One of my friends, he traveled all the way to Montreal in a night just to get ramen and then came back. <laughs> like, I think he just really wanted to try it there. Uh, they've got good food in Montreal. So my name's Tamara. I'm a co-lead health promotion educator with Rose. And a little fact about myself is that my favorite dessert is key lime pie. And I've been like on a hunt for the best key lime pie for years now. So uh, I tried it in the first time in Miami. It's amazing there. I would definitely recommend it. And then so ever since, I've just been on like this crazy hunt to get the best key lime pie. So if anyone knows where to get good key lime pie, definitely hit me up um, and so we are very excited today because we have an amazing guest uh, so we can introduce that guest yeah so we're having today Jamie we're so happy to have you Jamie with us so Jamie is an educator for the indigenous programs and outreach at education division at the National Gallery of Canada and uh, Jamie is an indigenous arts activator so activating the stories, teachings of social, political, and cultural matters through indigenous arts and culture. And Jamie, I love the uh, initiative of uh, indigenous walks, which um, Jamie is the founder. So uh, indigenous walks is a walking tour through downtown Ottawa, exploring landscape, architecture, art, and monuments through an indigenous perspective. So I really love that, like bringing uh, art, dance, education, and traditional practices. So welcome, Jamie. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, uh, a big thank you also to uh, Nathaniel for um, and yourself for the invitation. So uh, it's nice to be here. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. So I, I've been in Ottawa. I was just noticing for 20 years, as of June 16th. And I came here to work at um, Aboriginal People's Television Network at the time. And I was like 21. Hmm. 20, yeah, because I'm 41. So I've been here for 20. I've been here for half of my life. Yeah, time flies, eh? Anishinaabe territory. Yes, it does. Yeah, time flies. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. So um, thank you, Jamie. So we're also happy today to have Nathaniel from uh, the Mami Doswan Center. So Nathaniel, welcome. So can you tell us a little bit about your role at the Mami and what does the Mami Doswan mean? Yeah, so uh, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me to participate in the healthy uh, uh, nutrition eats of Nathaniel's uh, cooking show. Usually it's unrecorded and I'm just cooking for my family, but uh, but uh, I'm glad to have you folks here today. So um, I do work at the Mamadoswins uh, Center, which literally translates 
uh, from Anishinaabe Moen, uh, the Algonquin uh, dialect to the gathering place um, or walking together. Uh, so it is a place of gathering for our Indigenous students at the, at the Indigenous Centre. Uh, it's a place of just being, just gathering and being together. Uh, and normally every month we would have feasts uh, and we'd invite elders or educators um, and knowledge keepers like Jamie to come into our center and engage with our students. But obviously because of the situation, uh, we're bringing some things online. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to uh, be here with you folks and uh, to, to spend some time and uh, to do my best to, to show you how to cook some Manitoba soup. I have to say before we begin, I, uh, I assumed that this was, um, because it was Manitoba soup, it was, you know, there was some Métis and Cree influence. And, and when I looked at the ingredients, I think a lot of our Anishinaabe um, and, and, and Cree uh, 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 peers would say that this is a poor hunter soup because there's no meat, but we do have some protein source with the beans. Um, but anyways, it looks like a delicious soup. So I'm, uh, so I'm looking forward to cooking with you. Thank you. Thank you, Rose, and thank you, Tamara. And thank you, Jamie, for being here. Mm -hmm. Be nice. Great. Awesome. Thank you for that. I actually really miss the Mama Dozen Center, like now that you're just kind of talking about it, because I, I kind of always feel like whenever I end up there, I just feel like I take a load off, like just kind of like the anxiety just kind of falls off me when I enter that room and I just kind of like enter into like this vortex of like time not really existing and just kind of chilling out. So yeah, um, I'm just going to introduce our destination today. So um, you may have gotten from the little spiel there that we're going to be looking at Manitoba today. So Manitoba is a Canadian province bordered by Ontario to the east and Saskatchewan to the west. Um, so for those people who maybe didn't pay attention too much in high school and geography class such as myself, um, and so it's got tons of lakes, rivers, mountains, forests, and prairies stretching from uh, the Arctic tundra. So it's quite uh, close to Nunavut on top of it. And then Hudson Bay is quite close as well. Um, so nature is really sacred there. Uh, there's more than 80 provincial parks, which is great at a time like this when everyone wants to go camping. Um, and they're protected, so you can go hiking, biking, uh, canoeing, camping, and fishing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, my background here today. Um, so my background is the Northern Lights, as I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with. I think this is kind of like um, something that everyone really wants to experience at some point in their life. Like it's such a cool, like mystical, magical thing. Um, and so it's actually in Churchill, uh, Manitoba. So it's kind of, um, closer to Nunavut and it's on the Hudson's Bay and Churchill is really cool place because it's also got some polar bears and a lot of beluga whales. So um, moving on, Rose, would you let us know what your background is? Yeah, sure. So I chose this one. Uh, it's the market at the Forks. Uh, so as you see, it's a historic site and it was uh, all the warehouses were transferred to shops, restaurants, so it's really nice to see this. Um, outside of the market, there is also a green space where there's a lot of concerts, exhibits, and um, festivals that can happen there. So I really love it. It seems like very, you know, live <laughs> place. So definitely on my list to go. For sure, I'm sure it's bustling. So we're gonna go to the recipe ingredients and I just put it in the chat right now if you guys are interested uh, in looking at the ingredients. So it's there if you guys need it. And so Nathaniel, if you want to take us through the ingredients that we have today. Yeah, my pleasure. So I'm just gonna pull up my screen here. Um, yeah, I'll go in order of the recipe. Uh, basically, this is a you know, with the thing with soup, I'm, I'm I have to admit, usually as a as a as a cook, I use what I have. So um, uh, this is a really a great recipe because a lot of these things probably folks will already have in their cupboards. Um, keep in mind, you can improvise on some of these things. Some of the it's, you know, some of the ingredients call for like fresh herbs. If you don't have fresh herbs. Um, like fresh rosemary, fresh thyme. You certainly use dry ingredients. Usually you need to use a little bit more than it calls for, or, or, or sorry, a little bit less um, when you're using the dry because it's, it's shrunk. Um, but basically you're gonna need some uh, canola oil. Let me just 
I'm just going to change my screen here so I can see what I'm looking at. Um, so some canola oil. Uh, you can also use olive oil if you'd like, um, or even uh, maybe coconut oil, although uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a coconut tree growing in, in Manitoba. Um, I have some uh, celery stalks. Now my celery is quite sad. I was looking at fresh celery today, but it's a little whiter than it should be, but I'm going to use it anyways. Uh, we have some carrots that we're going to chop up. Um, we have an onion here. Uh, oh, I lost my screen. Um, we have onion. Uh, we have some garlic here. Uh, we have zucchini. Um, <laughs> Uh, funny enough, we, we did a test to make sure all these videos worked for Zoom doing two videos here. So I use half of my zucchini uh, to do the test, but you should have a whole zucchini if you, if you, if you can find it. Um, uh, uh, garlic, as I said. Uh, so I have a sweet potato here, as well as some other tomato uh, potatoes that I'm going to peel up there. Um, we, you're going to have uh, two to three tomatoes, I find is, is good. Um, Looking at some bay leaves. So bay leaves is just gonna be one of those uh, nice herbs that's just going to uh, add a lot of flavor. Um, thing I like to do with soup is I like to make a bigger soup and let it sit in my fridge for, uh, for a day or so. It really adds the flavor. And then, um, and then I have some vegetable broth, uh, veggie broth cubes here, some uh, red kidney beans that I've uh, strained from a, uh, from a can and then uh, poured some water uh, and rinsed it really well. You can also use dried kidney beans if you have the patience to uh, cook it. You can get a lot more for your money if you're willing to, to use dried beans and, and uh, boil them and, and cook them properly and then prepare them and you can freeze them after too. Um, uh, for, I don't have Swiss chard today, but I do have some, uh, some kale here and here that uh, I'm just gonna put in a salad spinner that I, I took what I need, pardon me, and I have uh, some spinach as well, uh, just to add some, some diversity. I looked at the Swiss chard when I was shopping uh, this morning and it just wasn't fresh. So, you know, you want to be in season and, and look for things that are, are good. Um, I don't have pumpkin puree, but before, before we got on the call, um, I did uh, put uh, a uh, acorn squash in the oven. I roasted it at uh, three uh, I believe 350 for about 20 minutes and it's, or 375 and it's quite soft now. Uh, so I just poke it with a fork uh, when I'm doing that, the pan's still hot, but I just cut, cut them in half and I put them on a pan of water and then just, uh, just bake them for a period of time. And then I, I poke them with a fork to know, uh, when they're done. So when they're, when they're soft, when the, when the fork just goes through, uh, it's pretty much pureeable. So we'll be, cutting those up. And what else do we have? Uh, we have uh, Worcestershire sauce, or however the heck you say that. Uh, been trying for, uh, for a number of years to figure that one out. And um, I have some mustard in my fridge and I have uh, pepper as well. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, pasta, I didn't really want to put pasta in. So I have a, a rice, a wild rice blend here. Um, this is from a family company, Floating Leaf. Uh, but basically, if you can support indigenous folks and get um, uh, uh, manumen from, you know, uh, uh, native reserves or, uh, you know, it's a staple, a staple grain that really uh, will highlight the soup well. And uh, that's about it. You can add par Parmesan. I, I'm not going to be adding that today, but if you'd like to, that's one of the optional things. So that's the, that's the, the, uh, the ingredients. Awesome. Sounds great. So I really love that this recipe is rich in ingredients. So like uh, celery stalks in specific, those are a good source of antioxidants and dietary fibers. They are also low in carbs and the raw and cooked ones are low glycemic index. So it's really a good recipe with so many ingredients. Yeah, and then we've got some nice Swiss chard there. Uh, so similar to spinach as well as, uh, it's great, kale is a good alternative as well. Um, really good in vitamin K, A, C, and has really good sources of magnesium, potassium, iron, and dietary fiber. Um, and I like Swiss chard because it's got so many different colors. There's also uh, rainbow chard, um, and there's some nice red chard, white chard as well. 
Yeah, we also have carrots, which are, which are antioxidants and have vitamin A. Onions, which is almost in each recipe, so it's stretched in vitamin C, dietary fibers, and folic acid. Tomatoes as well, um, they have an awesome amount of lycopene, and it's thought to have the highest antioxidant activity of all uh, the other carotenoids. And I think we've got garlic in just about all of our recipes that we've had so far in our episodes. Uh, but yeah. you know, we love garlic um, and it's really great for the heart and the blood. Uh, so any heart, uh, high blood pressure or high levels of cholesterol is really good for that. And I also recently learned um, that it is really good to add garlic at the end of your recipes. And that way you get most of the nutrients and actually the flavor out of it. I think a lot of the times we tend to um, start with garlic, uh, yeah. which is still good. I think you can do both. Uh, I kind of do both sometimes. Yeah, we also have uh, zucchini. Uh, so I, I love that Nathaniel is keeping the skin because uh, it's really uh, full of good stuff. So it's an excellent source of manganese, vitamin C, as well as uh, magnesium, vitamin A, and dietary fibers, potassium, copper, and folate. So it's really rich uh, recipe and um, it falls also and fits into Canada food guidelines. So as we mentioned, half of your plate goes to veggies and fruits, quarter goes to carbs and another quarter to proteins. Usually we focus on plant-based protein and for today we have red, uh, red kidney beans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so red kidney beans are an awesome source of plant-based proteins, great for vegan or vegetarian diets. Um, they're actually thought to originate from Peru, uh, but yeah, they're kind of the, uh, I guess, poor man's meat to some extent where, um, yeah, it, it's great to have that protein while they're still uh, cheap and you can kind of use them in most recipes. So um, we can kind of pan to Nathaniel here. Uh, what are you up to over there? I'm just cutting up the onion, doing my prep work. I always start with an onion. It was a pretty big, big onion. So um, depending on, you know, you might, folks might like onions more or less. Uh, I always start with that as my, my base with some, uh, with some oil. Sometimes I put just a little bit of water uh, so, so it doesn't stick. Um, but I like to have my onions not too fine because I, I, I like the, the texture of onions. But if you really, you know, if you would rather not, you can really dice them really fine. Um, yeah, please let me know if the, if the sound is too much. I can always mute myself if it's cutting in and out. Um, but I'm just going to do some prep while you folks are talking, if that's okay. Yeah, for sure. Great. So I just did my onion, uh, so I'm good for my onion. So I'll put that aside and now I'm just going to, uh, cut up my, um, my root vegetables and, uh, my, uh, and my zucchini and probably my tomatoes after and just get everything ready. So it's just throw it in the soup after and uh, let everything do its magic. So yeah. I am also on the note of skin, um, I, I like to, this is an organic sweet potato uh, from a local farm. Uh, depending on where, you know, what season it is, I, I like to, as much as I can, keep the, the skin. So I've, I've washed it pretty well. Um, I'm actually gonna take a little bit of a brush to it now. But if you can keep the skin, I don't know what you folks think from a nutritional point of view to keep those, all that fiber and that, uh, those minerals and things that are in the skin. I'd like to do that as much as I can. Yeah. Happy that you also are uh, having a sweet potato. So uh, it's really uh, have good nutrition ingredients and uh, it's high in fibers as well. So like the potato itself is good, but sweet potato has, um, more of the benefits so it's great so mm -hmm. um we've been like doing great research about manitoba but i think um like maybe you will start with more of the uh culture and uh sort of uh scoping the uh indigenous people there yeah, sure. I was just sort of, sort of taking some notes while you were um, chatting, things that came to mind. Mm -hmm. And um, so I should say that I'm, I'm not from Manitoba, but I do have a um, uh, similar culture to some of the Métis who are in the area as well as Saskatchewan. So I, I grew up in, in northern Alberta, which is um, 
a little place called Lac La Biche and, and uh, the, the place where my dad um, lives now is called Buffalo Lake Métis Settlement. So, so that's where he lives and uh, he, he lives off the land. So when he goes, um, you know, when he goes to get food, he's, he's like suiting up and getting out his boat and uh, setting traps or taking out his gun um, and, you know, providing not just for himself, but for uh, the whole community of Buffalo Lake. So, that, so that's something that um, recently has been a source of pride. Uh, and a lot of that um, community connection through food uh, was disturbed through, um, you know, things like residential school and uh, other forms of colonization. So that interrupted, um, you know, even our access to food. A lot of um, Métis in particular were getting um, charged for hunting and fishing and things like that. Things we, we've always done before Canada was a country. And now we're getting charged with them. And in fact, my dad was charged um, recently. And um, this was hard because he, he had made friends with, with somebody. And this is what happens a lot in indigenous communities that stops people from hunting and fishing. So a, a fish and wildlife officer sort of debated him for a year became friends with him and got my dad to sell him fish. Um, my dad never did sell him the fish, but um, my dad uh, ended up being charged with uh, fishing out of season or something like that. And so that's probably a case that's going to go to the Supreme Court so that we can eat on the land, you know. And one of the other things I was, I was thinking about is, is how you know, the, the stress around, you know, whether or not you're going to get in trouble for essentially grocery shopping. <laughs> and it's already tough because you're having to cut up an animal. You sometimes have to be the one who's distributing it. So you're driving around and houses are really far from each other. It's not like a neighborhood and a community, you know. So um, the one thing that we do make sure is that every you know part of the animal is used so even if we don't have the food uh, from it so let's say like the guts or, or whatever of the of a deer or, or a moose those go to um, like small animals so my dad would go put it by a tree or something and you know if if they're suffering that winter or whatever it is then at least they have the food from the hunter Lots of animals survive because of hunters, you know. So, um, yeah, so that's the, like predatorial, especially predatorial animals. But, and, and that all keeps the, the whole you know, nature in balance, you know. So, so um, we, can, we can tell from our food what our environment is, you know, when we get the fish and we see in its eyes, we can tell the health of the waters. And that informs us about... Um, it informs us about um, how to change or adapt, is the word I'm trying to think of, to adapt to accessing that food. So, um, yeah. for instance, my dad has said, you know, a couple of times um, he's pulled out worms, at, like eyes uh, of the fish full of worms, and, and then he can tell that the fish have a, a something that's not healthy, and then Nobody can eat that, you know? So, so like fisher people, my dad as a knowledge keeper, he has to, he knows what's going on and he keeps everybody informed. He's kind of like, like a researcher, a scientist, you know, without having a degree. I think he has grade eight education, but he's the one who's informing people about traditional knowledge through, um, the the land and you know and, and what we eat so I, that's a it's a really long winded I, a lot of a lot of things came to mind but so many people in the prairies who are Métis have been charged with um, like hunting or, or fishing and and we know like we're the ones who are not wanting to overfish or overhunt 
that is not something that we want to do. So, so we're, you know, the, the people, the hunters who are out there are keeping things in balance and, and that's hard for people to understand. And they say, well, it's not fair that first nations get rights outside of a particular season or, you know, no, they're not going to fish while they're spawning, you know? So, mm-hmm. so things like that. Yeah. I okay. thought about the, I thought about the meaning of, um, like soup <laughs> in our language mm-hmm. and, um, like for tea, we say muskegee mapoi, and that just means, like muskegee means medicine. Anything apoi is liquid. So even soup, so tea is a liquid medicine. So all of the plants. And then the soup itself is also a liquid, but it's a more chunky, like in our language, it translates to like a chunky liquid soup. A medicine, I should say. And so the medicine in that it would be like boiling the bones to get out all of the broth, uh, to get to make a broth from the marrow. Um, and so, so those are all, you know, important, important ways to get our vitamins when the sun's not coming out. Um, you know, where I'm from in the summertime, we've got like 21 hours of sunlight in the summertime. So right now it would be that much until June 21st and then that's you know that's our time for celebration but in the winter time at three o'clock it gets dark right so we we have to think about you know that as well in terms of our environment but um the medicine soup or the the medicine part of the soup is, is not just in how you know what you're boiling what you're making but it's in how you are um it's, it's in how, so, so much to explain. Hmm. I'm going to tell you like the purpose of life. So you, every, so you know, okay. It's, it's about balance. Okay. Nihiao means a person with four parts, the physical, the spiritual, the emotional, and the, in, and the intellectual, the mental. And our only purpose in life that's it. Our only purpose in life is to keep that balance. Our purpose is not a teacher or a mother. Our purpose is not as educators or aunties or presidents or prime ministers. That's not our purpose. Our purpose is not to fight for the poor. Our purpose is not to uh, fight for injustices. Our purpose is to keep ourselves in balance and then think about what happens when we do that everybody else is affected by your balance and it's and that's and that's all that we have to do that's our only purpose in this life and um you know that uh was taught to me through different many different elders Duke Redbird was one of them uh, that we were, you know, chatting and, and he was the one who talked about that last person I talked to. But um, anything, you know, anything else. So what does that mean? You know, your, your mental health, your physical, your emotional, your spiritual, all those things have to be kept in balance. So what does this have to do with our food? When we get our food, we're not just aiming and shooting and tracking down an animal. You know, uh, a long time ago was that lots of First Nations people wore their most beautiful clothing to go hunting because they knew that what they were about to do was something very sacred and they had a relationship with those animals. And so um, now what one of the, the things that my, my dad does and, and a lot of Métis people practice, but not everybody. So there's different you know, ways that people practice things is that they'll lay down uh, tobacco, sacred medicine, and that's uh, giving an offering to the spirit after it's leaving. And there's all like a million teachings in all of this. Tobacco has another teaching and, and why, we, why do we use tobacco, you know, to give thanks. Um, so that's another story. Um, but the way in, in which the animal itself is, um, uh, 
you know, is killed is done in a certain way. And the way an animal is um, even like distributed and, and, you know, shared and cut up. And then there's also, um, you know, the feast. So there is an understanding that that animal will bring people together. And in those communal spaces, they're speaking their language. So they're perpetuating our language. They're talking about who's, you know, turning a woman or a man or who's, um, you know, uh, partnering or having a child or who needs stuff, you know, and, and that's where you get a lot of um, the, the life of the community. It was fed by that animal, you know, so that's um, why it's so important to have that much respect for the food plants you know we sing songs when we're collecting plants we're putting that energy and we're not tearing plants out by the roots and we're not um ripping barks off the wrong way off the tree that will damage a tree and then it, that if you take it one piece of bark off of a tree not only do you damage that tree but you damage the whole uh, tree system around it so we have to be kind and we have to be nice to you know, the spirits that are out there who are providing us with vitamins and sustenance. Um, and that's, and that's sort of where we start with ourselves being in balance. Mm. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was a uh, wedge for sharing that. Yeah. I, um, I'm really sorry to hear from for your father, uh, being able, you know, not being able to um, hunt and fish in the same way, um, and, and in the way that he's doing it holistically, as you mentioned, where mm -hmm. food is something bringing people together, and and done so in in a very intentional way. Um, yeah. So I am sorry for that, and it it reminds me also of um, you know things that keep reoccurring uh, over history and in current times as well uh, with, with the pipeline and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that kind of impeding a, a certain way of life. Mm -hmm. And people coming in and, and sort of just like not really even knowing or understanding that important um, management and caretaking role that and even the spiritual role they have to play you know they have to play all, all those roles it's a very physical job it's a lot of um learning over a lifetime how to track you know and seeing the changes over time and when people come in they don't understand or know hmm. what the hunter is doing and and how important he is to a community you know there's um you know, even sometimes justice is held through hunters um, in, in, our, in our community because it was a survival of everybody that um, was important and nobody could just like hoard food or anything like that, you know. So it is, uh, you know, we do have a, a land, we do have land uh, in Buffalo Lake Métis Settlement that belongs to Métis, but you know, at the end of the day, the Alberta government could come and sort of say, with a swipe of a pen and say, you don't exist anymore. It's not easy. Like the power still doesn't, you know, as much as possible, as much as they'll allow, that's how much power, you know, is there to, to um, feel comfortable and safe going hunting on the land. Otherwise, my dad's going to be eating food that's um, hard to get up there because it's, three hours north of um, Edmonton. So uh, what will happen then is they'll end up making bannock, which is a bread that, you know, that it's made out of flour, sugar, salt. And when he was going through his very difficult time, um, he was seeing both a, a mainstream doctor and a medicine man in our community, in another community close to him. And, um, he said the first thing that you have to do to heal 
you know, whatever it is my dad was dealing with, is to cut out all the white things. All the flour, all the sugar, all the salt, all the cornstarch, all the milk, all the like dairy. He said, cut out everything white. So, how, you know, what do you think about that for a metaphor? <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't really apply when you're Métis, but it's an interesting, you know, dynamic. And, you know, he got, he got healthy with the help of both. He still has, you know, other reoccurring issues, but with that one issue, he was able to tame it down. And so, um, and then there was a whole other, you know, regiment of, as a healer, he re re requests the person needing healing to do things like, make food and that food becomes an offering and you pray and you give that food before you even eat it and sometimes it comes in the form of a spirit plate so when you're about to have a feast you pick up different parts of all the food even water whatever it is and then you smudge it and you pray and our prayers are not about, can you heal my sick grandmother? Can you help my child who's struggling with bullying in school? That's not our prayers, because um, those aren't prayers for us. It's um, just being like, you know, thank you for this food. Thank you for, it's about, our prayers are about being grateful. And all of that stuff has to go into the offering that you're giving, you know, through food, um whatever it is so all of it it's all it's all related you know because what what we how we get our food and all of that energy that we put into growing it or harvesting it berries plants medicine singing to the plants you know that that's like how we recognize our kinship because we're all related mm -hmm. and so um everything that we do and how we collect it is going into our bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you talk a lot about balance and kind of that holistic sort of point of view. And I really do um, want to get back to it. I did want to check in with Nathaniel quickly on how our soup is doing. I think um, some of the prep work has uh, maybe ended or... Yeah, so I've got everything chopped up. I uh, was just doing that in the background. Uh, I brought everything to the stove over there and I changed the camera angle. I, I, I can't see it from this computer, but uh, I need a, a film crew here. So um, I just want to say, Jimmy, watch power, very powerful things you're sharing with us, Jamie, um, that key part about balance. It's so important, you know, and whenever I'm cooking with food this year with all the stuff, um, you know, the, self, the pandemic and the self-isolation, I, I thought a lot about seeds and about our relationship to the land and how, you know, how so many of our generations uh, from all cultures uh, have been affected by that. And uh, uh, more notably in indigenous communities whose lands have been um, uh, removed from them. So it is what you're saying is so key because if we all lived in that balance, it's, uh, it's so key. So back to the can maybe hear them a little bit. They're starting in the background. So I'm just going to go stir up. I usually just let my onions get semi-translucent uh, in the oil. Uh, so I'm just going to go stir that and um, finish cutting up the tomatoes. But everything else is pretty much prepped to go in. Um, and I do like to do the order. I do onions. Uh, as you say, I only do garlic later. I used to do gar garlic and onions together, but it does take away some of the flavor. Um, and... Uh, so I'll do that and then I'll throw in the root vegetables and because those need usually a little bit uh, more cooking time. So you can see here, the onions probably need about another minute or so. Uh, they're not sticking, so I'm not going to add any water yet. Um, uh, yeah, and so I have all my root vegetables here together. I have my sweet potato, my carrots. I decided not even to put in a potato. I'm just putting in the sweet potato. I think it's going to be enough. And uh, I'm going to add those, and then I'm going to add my softer uh, veggies. Uh, and then the last thing I'm going to add after I add the water is um, my uh, rice, and my, uh, and then lastly, uh, when the soup is even closer to being done, because I like the, 
the greens to be really uh, vibrant. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll add those in uh, when the soup's pretty much almost done. I don't know if you folks can hear me, but there's too much echo. I'm talking away. This, um, so anyway, I'll add those in, let those cook up for a little bit. I'll probably add a little bit of water here just so nothing sticks. And um, if you like to preserve, like keep the humidity in here, I usually put a lid on uh, to just let it uh, uh, stick simmer here. So I'm going to bring this up. I, I'm about uh, at medium. I'm just going to bring it up to high and get a little more uh, okay. heat going. And then um, uh, one, uh, one thing I will say is I'm not a professional chef. So if you are a professional chef watching me and I'm making mistakes, well, you can always comment in the video, in the uh, comments section of the social media stream. Um, anyway, so back to you folks. I think this is a really awesome conversation. So I'll just continue cutting the tomatoes and feel free to check in with me at any time. Yeah, for sure. You should be able to see everything that's going on in the pin video um, and following along there. Uh, I like that you mentioned seeds. Uh, I've been doing a bit of growing um, in the garden recently. And um, I just recently yesterday had like fresh lettuce from the garden. Uh, and it it's actually crazy how different it tasted. Um, I didn't think it would be that different, but I think you can actually really taste that freshness. Um, and yeah, just uh, being able to, I think in this time, especially uh, with the pandemic and everything, I think that it's been so refreshing to connect with nature. Um, and I think that it does really add actually to that balance in a sense that Jamie was speaking to. Um, and it, it reminds me a little bit what you were speaking to, uh, like the medicine wheel, in a sense, like the four quadrants and having that balance. And I would love uh, if you could speak more to it, Jamie. Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> so... Um, so just in terms of, of yes, in, in terms of the balance, um, another interesting collection or, or harvesting practice that I learned about through Anishinaabe friends who are really like right on the border with Manitoba. So their food source also, I mean, Manitoba and Ontario, they're, they're not really real borders, right? So, so what they call um, their wild rice is uh, like Nathaniel said, Manoomin, Manoomin. and uh, Manoomin is uh, um, also collected in a very uh, interesting way. And I went with my friend and uh, you're physically sitting in a canoe and you're having to balance with these two long sticks, you know, and um, you're kind of like going through the rice, the tall, tall rice, and then you're in the canoe and you have these two sticks going like this, right? And so we're racing and it's called racing. And then we get back and then he tells me about the ricing worms, you know, which are really, I don't know if you've ever seen rice worms, but there's, they look like miniature grubs and they're yucky. So, <laughs> but they have, they all have their, they all have a purpose and they end up in your clothes and your hair and everything because you're, you know, they just, that's just how it goes. So, um after they they you know they they do a number of uh, they have a whole process but what i learned was that they actually dance the rice and what that means is that once it's all collected you have to dance on the rice to take off some of the husks so there's music and there's people uh -huh. who are you know physically moving their bodies in this happy, beautiful way with other community members in a ceremonial practice. And it, like, I, can, I can't go on because it's not my, um, to say, but there's so much that gets released from dancing that way on the rice that wouldn't get released normally that comes into our systems, you know, and there's, and, there, and so there's so many interesting things. One time my friend actually sent some rice in the mail and I had gone there and we had, we had made Facebook friends actually. 
and um, I had gone there with my husband and I met this person I met on uh, Facebook in person and he was doing community work there and I was doing community work in Ottawa and he's the one who took me racing and we had mutual friends, a lot, a lot of mutual friends. And so um, he actually brought us like puffed rice. So you, you get a little oil and you have the wild rice and you, you get the, oil, the pan hot and you put the oil in there and it, and it turns into like puff, puffed rice. And then you put maple syrup on it that they harvested themselves. And then you put some collected either blueberries or raspberries, you know, from the bush. And it's so, you know, it's so good. It's so good. And um, so I had this there and he promised he would send some rice. So the following year, once they collected the rice, I got these, like, I got four packages of, like, really tightly packed rice from Canada Post, and the first night I had it, I opened one of the packages, and there was a slit in the side, and, and kind of the rice, if it was tilted, the rice would have all spilled out, so I had it carefully placed on the uh, counter, and so, like, in terms of food and, like, um, nutrition for the spirit um, in our area, one of the beliefs we have is that if you leave out food, then that's an offering. So if you don't clean up after yourself, after supper, after dishes, you're inviting spirits into your home. And that's why we usually give our offerings outside, you know, away from us. And so if you don't clean up after yourselves, you, you invite these spirits because they think they're you're offering stuff. And so I left this package of rice open and <laughs> some rice fell out onto the countertop. And this was the time my, my son was just a baby. And um, I mean, he's only not even two now, but so it wasn't that long ago and I was sleeping with him and I was just falling asleep. And I, I, I felt like I could like see and feel just like black um, shapes, presence. And I got so scared because it reminded me, it took me right back to my, you know, culture of, um, you know, what happened. So I, I grabbed the rice. First thing I got up, I called Stephen first. I called my husband and he came in and I, I couldn't sleep in the room that night. And so I, I grabbed the rice and I grabbed my smudge and I took it outside and I, and I just left the rice outside for a bit and put an offering out there to let it go, right? And so I, I heard, you know, some interesting things that, um, like, sometimes the energy that comes with that rice or the person who has that rice, it will, it will come here, in, you know, one other in, in a certain form or another. So we, we got it all out and I, I um, made rice and had company over, so I feasted it. And I asked, you know, questions about how do I take care of these hungry spirits, you know, and, and so I got some advice and that's what I did. And it went to really good use at community gatherings and, and things like that. So that's my little, you know, uh, food spirit story. <laughs> Actually, awesome. you know, um, Beth Brandt, maybe? She has a book called Food and Spirits. And she's talking about our kind of spirits, you know. And mm -hmm. so she's a Mohawk lady and... Um, it's like something that is another um, philosophy, I guess, is our like world view that, you know, everything is related. But when we say everything, we mean rocks. We mean like the little lights that you see that look like fireflies, but they're just like not the lights, you know, things like that. So anyway, that's, that's all. Food is a very important part of ceremony, and food is a, a very important part of medicine. They're, they're not, you know, on any kind of hierarchy above or below us, um, and that's the same with the animals, you know, all of those. So that's, the, that's a bit more about that, you know, understanding of, of balance. And, you know, um, it's just so balanced in nature itself, because let's say you're out and, and you're getting a some skin reaction to uh, poison ivy or something 
um, whatever it is, you know, you'll always, always find the cure for that whatever illness, just yeah. like only a few feet or meters uh, from the, from the, the culprit. <laughs> so, and they usually look alike, but there will be um, a small difference. For instance, like a Labrador tea, you know, you can put that in a broth too. So you can make, uh, and it helps relax you more than chamomile tea. And this is something that uh, people call on the East Coast Labrador tea, but we call it um, muskeg tea, where I'm from, because you find it in the muskeg. It, it grows in um, marshy areas. Like you can't, you need, like you don't walk in there because you could get stuck because moose get stuck in muskeg and die sometimes. It's like quicksand of the woodlands. So when, um, anyway, so I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> no problem i'm sure it'll come back to you it always does right sometimes anybody want to remind me where i was going with that <laughs> in the comments so i know that um it kind of what you had said sort of resonated with me uh in a sense that when it comes to mindfulness when it comes to food mm -hmm. um i think that a lot of the times kind of in in the culture that we have nowadays, it's so easy with fast food or, you know, just to not really pay attention to actually where your food is coming from, um, the taste of your food, the texture of your food, the aroma of your food. Like and who also, sings to their food, you know, like. <laughs> that's awesome, though. That's Before so it's a cool. meal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I think it's that honoring, right? And it, it yeah, does it deserve a lot of honoring because it's such a magical thing, almost, like almost, that it grows from the ground and that we cultivate it. And it, it's a relationship, right? In a sense? Yeah, yeah most definitely. And, um, you know, and, it, and again, it is, you know, always going back to that balance and how we maintain that relationship. But um, I remember what I was going to say, which was the balance you know, in nature itself when you're walking. And so we call it muskeg tea, but um, they call it Labrador tea on the East Coast. And that's something where you can find, you know, there's two plants. They literally grow like side by side like this. One of them's Labrador tea and that we can drink and is good for you. And one of them will poison you. Mm. So you have to know who you're going with and they look exactly the same and there's only one small difference. Does anybody know what that small difference is? No idea. It's such an odd thing. It's just like a fuzzy back of the leaf. That's the good one. If the back of the leaf has like an orange kind of fuzz on it, then um, that's your Labrador, that's your muskeg tea. Is that like a rule? Is that like, yeah, Nathaniel? We have some. I'm going to go grab it and I'll throw it in the soup. So I'll be oh. right back. Awesome. Wow, that works out perfectly. Yeah. Is that like a rule? Like, does fuzziness equal, like, is it better? Like, is that fuzziness a rule I can itself, apply? Fuzziness itself is usually the opposite. It's, yeah. It usually is an indicator for us to stay, for humans to stay away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's all, like I said, it's about balance. So, there is like the tiniest, tiniest amount of like a narcotic in, uh, in um, muskeg tea. Mm. So it, it's equivalent to like, remember I said it's a little more relaxed. So people who are really affected by chamomile tea, mm. you'll be affected by uh, muskeg tea. And it just really like makes you feel super, but kind of like CBD maybe. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it's lavender, right? No. Like, no. No. Oh. No. It's um, muskeg tea, which is uh, on the East Coast, they call it Labrador tea. Labrador. Okay. That's where I was getting it wrong. I wasn't sure. That sounds so, really interesting. Should I chop it up fine, Jamie? Well, normally what you would do is you would treat it like you're creating a broth. So you would get a hot water, you would pour hot water on top of it. And you would let it okay, soak for it about six minutes and then you use that Perfect. water as a broth. Yeah. Hmm. 
and and like there's a whole like sensitivity around how we use water with our food as well so um i mean there isn't food in general at anybody who you know like is a chef or whatever i, I just kind of intuitively understands that like you, you can't just put those leaves in, in boiling water if you want to get this result, you know? You have to boil the water first and then pour. Uh, mm. Like cedar tea, for instance, you can get cedar, but if you keep the, if you boil it, you boil out the, to you boil toxins out, even in the air, not just to drink. Oh. So, yeah, so, I mean, um, it depends on, it, it, it depends on like the type of cedar as well, right? So cedar is good for you in your lungs and everything when it gets like that. But if it's the wrong type of cedar, be dangerous. White, white cedar, I think, or red cedar. There's one that we don't have like really around here naturally. Oh. And again, I'm from, I'm from Northern Alberta, so. But um, yeah, and then you could put a little bit of maple syrup in once you poured the hot water on um, cedar for three minutes. Any longer will make it taste bitter. And then you um, serve it cold or hot. It's really nice in the summertime. So it's a good summertime. You know, literally, you can go and pick cedar in one of the parks or the green belt, you know, area and just um, boil your water. And I, I usually use a big bowl, like a giant silver bowl, uh, just because then I don't have to kind of rip apart this cedar because what I'm actually looking for is in the leaves, you know, and they're an odd looking hard leaf, but that is a leaf. So I don't necessarily take the bark apart, the branches, I mean. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you put in a... Um, the maple syrup so it good. wow that sounds amazing and i'm actually such a tea fanatic like oh, most yeah. people who know me like i'm so into tea um and so i've been trying like all these different types but i've tried cedar tea i think once like at algonquin college actually but i think uh i'll probably have to try the different uh, styles of making it. I'm sure there's different styles of making it and kind of perfecting it as well. But for me, raspberries and blueberries, like it, it's, it's, it's a really nice base. It's like, like the indigenous green tea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that's great. Cause uh, for me, like I can't tolerate caffeine much, even like the slightest bit of caffeine. So, um, and cedar tea wouldn't be any caffeine or anything, or it, it seems a lot of the teas uh, that you were speaking of are kind of, more like calming down teas, you know? Yeah, except for the sense. one with the narcotic, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this is really an interesting talk and we can't stay like for long, but I think we only have two minutes left. So um, I will give the mic first to Nathaniel so he could, uh, let us know what he's doing and final steps for the soup and then a final word to Jemmy as well. Perfect. You folks hear me okay? Oh, oh. Yes, I can hear you. I'm getting echo. So, gotta... He's just got to tame his like army of computers that he's got over there. You hear <laughs> they me? tend to act up sometimes. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. So I'm just adding in the herbs now. It's usually the last thing I do and I'll add in the garlic. Uh, with rosemary, personally, I just like to rub it. Um, so I'll just take a few sprigs and then like put it in my, my, my palm. Actually, I might chop this up because it's really fresh. But I just like to rub it. It brings out the flavor more. And um, I've already put in some bay leaves. I put in kale because it's a little bit hardier. It's the cabbage leaf, right? And then I'll add uh, spinach. I'm going to let the rice cook a little bit longer, but um, the spinach I'll let uh, I'll just put right at the end, pretty much when I'm ready for the soup. So I keep as much as the enzymes intact as possible. You can see that color of the, uh, I don't know if you folks can see it. Probably shouldn't turn my soup. And I'll just add in the garlic. And it's 
I saved uh, I saved the um, the seeds from my squash. I I I personally like roasted uh, squash mm. seeds, so I'm gonna roast them later, maybe with a little bit of oil and, and garlic, and uh, put in my my garlic. I probably added more garlic than the recipe asked asked for, just because it's uh, that season. I want to keep my folks healthy and myself healthy, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So that's that is uh, today's Manitoba soup. I'm sure there are many kinds of uh, there's many kinds of Manitoba soups out there, and they're probably mostly on the fly. I really learned a lot from listening to Jamie talk about using teas and soups, and it expanded my uh, my mind as a uh, as a someone who likes to cook and uh, find balance uh, in, in my relationship with food. So uh, thank you Health Services for inviting us. And uh, so Chibi Bush, everyone who came on the, uh, the show, I hope this helped you feel like being, that you were being in the Mamados Food Center. You know, just in our life, we spend so much time as human doings, but if you can just be like a honeybee and just be in our day, be our day goes a lot smoother. So anyways, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I hope you folks have a wonderful day. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. Jamie, last words? Thank you. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> You've said it all. <laughs> I think so. I gave, really you the, I gave you the secret to life. I don't think I can tell you anymore. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, it was excellent. We really enjoyed it. Like myself, I learned so much today, not only from Nathaniel and the food, but also from Jemmy, like those interesting uh, points of food and the relationship to uh, purpose of life and other um, things in life. So we really appreciate it. So everyone, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a great time with you as well. If you want to reach to us at any time, you can uh, email us at HS healthy promotion at Algonquin college.com. And uh, we're, your feedback is always welcome. So thank you, everyone. Bye. -bye. Thanks so much. Thank Hope to see you guys next time. <laughs>